To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, my God, I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Surely none who wait for you will be put to shame. For those who are faithless without cause will be disgraced. Show me your way, O Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. All day long I wait for you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and loving devotion, for they are from age to age. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my rebellious acts. Remember me according to your loving devotion, because of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore. He shows sinners the way. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. And all the Lord's ways are loving and faithful to those who keep his covenant and his decree. Thank you, Alan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's okay. I'm tired too. So, I mean, first sermon of 2022. I, I was actually kind of nervous down there before I came. I was like, uh "Oh, I'm, my stomach's feeling a little queasy." I, this is not a feeling I haven't I felt in a long haven't felt in a long time. So it's kind of a little nervous here. A um, couple of things I definitely need to get out of the way real quick. Uh, one, I want to say happy birthday to my mom. So it is her birthday today. I want to. Uh, Ask anybody that comes tonight if you'll help us out because I've had some churches call and they're coming, so I'm excited about that. But we're going to be serving food and uh, we're going to meet in the Family Life Center, so that means we're going to have chairs set up and then right after we eat, we're going to put tables up. So we're we're just going to make all this happen down there. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be great. Um, but obviously, serving the food that takes a lot of people. Food will be ready. It'll all be good. I think, Lord willing, nothing catastrophe happens today. I think it'll all be good, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I want to remember George and Gail. Um, they were exposed to COVID, and one of them tested positive, and so I just want to keep them in our prayers. I know that's, that's difficult. I want to, want to let you know the game night went successful. There, there was no, no hard feelings, I don't think, as I look at Jennifer. Look at Je She went, oh, so what? It's all right. Well, I've been, it's been a run joke with the Chisholm's and us, so it's, it's all good. Although Emily didn't even finish the game she started with me, she left, so I don't know what I did wrong, but <laughs> no. Um, I don't know if anybody had this trouble this morning. I did. I put the wrong date on my check. I put 12, 2, 21, so actually I put 12 and I put the 21, and then I realized I messed up, so then I just put a dot between the 1 and the 2. So the 1 and 2 are really close, <laughs> and then try to mess the 21 up, but I hope no one has those problems. Last the leaders, I'm going to text a few people tonight. I've got a few things to, to, to finish off before the registration goes in tomorrow. So if you get a text from me, I'd appreciate you answering it real quick, and then I'll just move on. I won't bother you very long, so that'll be good. And I wanted to mention one other thing before I get to my opening part was, is, I can't see back there. I see Cody. Is Karen back there? There she is. Karen, I prayed for you because you went on this basketball trip. And I haven't even heard the stories yet, but when I heard that the plane was canceled, I, I, I started praying for you. And, and Trent was running around here that morning talking about they didn't, something about may have to do a bus, I don't know, something, whatever. And I was like, well, if I, I went, oh, I can't drive a school bus. And then I started really getting sick to my stomach because I don't even know what that would be like to drive a school bus all the way to Orlando. But thank you for doing that. I'm assuming everybody was safe. I heard somebody purchased comfort like some uh, blankets and pillows for y'all. Praise God for them. How nice. So I can imagine a trip like that. I've, I've done it on the comfort of a church bus going overnight with other drivers, and it was fairly easy, but, man, that's, that's a big deal. I don't know if you've ever gone that far overnight like that, but thank you for doing that. I'm glad God was there for you and took care of that group. I'm sure y'all had fun, but that could be stressful. So I, I can't say enough about that. I understand that. 
Uh, this week, uh, George, he stepped out of the office, I think it was on Monday, because he found out that somebody in his family tested positive. And he said, so you know what that means. And I went, well, if you don't get better by Sunday, I guess I can preach. He went, no, that means you are preaching Sunday. So um, he went on vacation in December, which left me two weeks there, and then I did a class for the adults. So I was running low on material in my head. And so most of this week when people said, what are you going to preach on? I said, I still haven't figured that out yet. I figured it out last night, <laughs> just in time. Um, but I do want to tell you, I did watch a video this week, and I've been talking about unity for a lot, and I thought it was great. So if you get a chance to see this, please do. It's called The Rescue, National Geographic. It's on Disney and maybe showing at movies right now. I don't know for sure. But it's about the kids that were trapped, the soccer team that was trapped in um, Thailand in 2018. If you remember that, it was on the news. They were trapped for like 18 days. They went in to this cave, and while they were in there, the monsoon came a month early, and it just rained and, and flooded the cave so they couldn't get out. And it got really bad because it kept flooding, flooding, and it just kept the, pushing the kids farther and farther and farther and farther back in this cave. It was eight days before they were even found. And as I watched this, all I could think about was unity and the church. Because in Thailand, they got a lot of people that know what they're doing, but they needed a lot more people. They needed 5,000 people to make that whole thing work and get those kids out alive. There were things done that everybody said was impossible, and there are people that said we're not going to stop trying to figure out the solution. And it was absolutely amazing. The solution, if you remember, was, was to send divers into the cave. Into a, it's, it's a river coming through the cave. It's not like stagnant water. So that's new. But was to go get a child, put them under anesthesia, knock them out, put a face mask on them, bind their hands, take them like 200 yards, had a thousand, excuse me, a thousand meter swims. They had to take them 200 meters and then give them anesthesia again. These are, these are people that don't do that. The cave divers don't do that. And when they tried to find these kids, the Navy SEALs from Thailand, their version of our Navy SEALs, couldn't get in the cave because they'd never done that. So they had to get these divers from all over the world that had cave dived, but not really ever brought a living human being out. And when they first went in, the first place they came up, there were people, and they thought, we found the kids. No, those were people that were trying to pump the water out that fell asleep and got trapped in the cave. And the water was rising, so they, they swam them out. And he said, could you imagine putting a breathing apparatus in a person's mouth taking them underwater, they don't have goggles, and you're going through this cavern with just little holes. So it was a disaster, and they knew that if they could barely get a living person out, uh, an adult, how are they going to get a living child out? And so there were things that they had to do, and somebody came up with the idea of putting them under, and the surgeon that had to come see, he had to see the children before he would commit to doing it. He was a cave diver, so he went a thousand meters in, and saw the children and said, if this is the only way, then we'll do it. And they put those kids under, put a mask, by the way, proud of America. Because when we come in, we may not have all the answers, but we're there to facilitate solutions. And they said, we need a positive flow mask. Though. So if the mask starts to leak while this kid's going and we're swimming and we don't know, he doesn't drown. Americans had a mask that pushes the water out instead of the water coming in. And they had it on site. They had four of them. They did four kids at a time. It was incredible. It was like the church working together. And there was all these times when someone would say, I have this idea. And someone would say, that won't work. And then someone had to come in and say, we've got to facilitate this to work. And all these different countries coming in together to make it work and save those, I believe it was 12 children, was incredible. Matter of fact, Nancy was walking back before. She didn't know I was watching. I had started it. And I was trying to look at some lesson material. And I started getting teary-eyed, and I was like, wipe my tears away like she wouldn't see. You know, men don't do that, right? We don't watch shows and start crying like that. But Alan, I started crying, and I couldn't help it. It was absolutely amazing. So if you watch that, someday I'll do a lesson on it. It was incredible. 
What had to come together? And if you don't think God's hand was there, it was God bringing them out. Just after they finished getting those kids out, it was like 18 days, like the 19th, 20th day, it all completely flooded out. That was it. There was no air left. And they, they thought maybe we should leave them there for four months until the water goes down. And somebody says, they're not going to have enough air to make it that long. They won't have enough air for another day or two. It was right down to the wire. And I was proud that America went there. We didn't have all the solutions, but we brought it all together. And sometimes that's what it helps. We may not know the answer, but we get in there and we work and we help. And I just couldn't, couldn't say enough good things about that, that they all work together. So if you, it's very rare you get to see a show like that and you don't have to worry about language or anything like that. It's just a good show to watch. That's a good one. And just think in mind like I was, unity in the church, and you'll definitely glean from that. In my lesson today, um, in my lesson today, I'm not going to mention, before I say this, don't, it's okay. I'm not going to mention a single scripture from here. That doesn't mean there won't be scripture. But I've heard that before. Well, he was full of all fluff and he didn't say any scripture. No, no, there's scripture. I'm just not saying any. Is that okay? Maybe not. This may be my last time. We'll see. <laughs> well, I heard that rod on that lesson on YouTube, and he didn't say a single scripture. So I hope, I don't know, is the, is the PowerPoint where I can go, Charlie? There we go. So 22, 2022 is here, finally. Could this be a third year in the row that we have just trouble, or could this just be the breakout time? Is the Omicron leaving? Is that, is that going to be the last variant, or is there going to be another one? with another weird name that I can't pronounce right, will it just leave? I don't know. I, I didn't have a picture of New York because it didn't seem like they celebrated very well last, last night, or the, I guess Friday night, but Nashville did. You know, center of the United States or in that area, that's nice to see them celebrating. So I, I thought about a lesson, and I had people suggest lessons, and one of the suggestions was, well, it's 2022, talk about what you're gonna do for 2022. Well, I, that immediately, it felt played out. But I thought, I thought, what if I come from a different approach and just kind of repackage it, maybe y'all won't know the difference. No, I'm just kidding. I'll repackage it and say, what would it be like if I could talk to myself 30 years ago and say, what, what should you have done 30 years ago. See, a lot of times we look to the future and we're going, we want to do these things to make ourselves better, but what if we could look back and go, what would have made you better when you were 18? For me, it'd be 30 years. Some, there's a lot longer in here. And, and that might be, I think you would agree with the, most of the things I'm going to say today. There might be some differences. I was thinking about Archie Green, and I was thinking when he was 18, or in that age group, he was in World War II. He wasn't worried about, worrying about pandemics. He was worried about Nazi bullets going past his head. So there may be a little bit difference. I thought about Burt Jones. Burt Jones, you remember, he, he came here one year, which is odd, and he led a singing seminar. Then he came here one year, and he led an Islam seminar. Do you remember that? It's kind of odd. I thought it was. But the second time he was here, I got to sit down with him a lot and talk. And I, he had went to Vietnam. I, I think I've told this story before, uh, but just bear with me. He went to Vietnam, and I asked him a lot of things I, I had no business asking, and I certainly wasn't prepared for the answers because he was just straight on about it. And I would never repeat some of the stories he ever told me. They were just gruesome. But one of the things he said about Vietnam, Randy, because I know you were there, he said he went to Vietnam, and he wasn't a Christian. Can you imagine? How many men went to Vietnam not prepared spiritually? And he just talked about how sick that makes him to think that his life was at, his soul was at risk. So when I think about going back to 18, I'm at least in the mindset of, Rod, you're a Christian. These are some of the things I wish that you knew. And so if you're a teenager in here, you can learn a lot right now and skip the hard lessons 
But that's the problem is when we're 18, we, don't, we think we already know it all, and we don't listen. The best thing you do is listen and apply. Maybe you'll agree with me. I think most of you will agree with these ideas. I could be wrong. We'll find out. So the first thing I would like to tell my 18-year, most of these, not most of them, some of them I got right. But I, I wanted to boil this down because I wanted to talk spiritually for myself at 18. I want you to know these things. And the very first one, please marry a radical, risk-taking, go-anywhere-for-Jesus Christian. That was number one. I think I did that right. I think I did. I don't think you can go wrong taking the effort to marry the right spouse, the one that will help you weather discouragement. And if you're young right now and you're not married and you're wondering, you want that spouse that's going to help you grow spiritually close to God. So the lesson for number one is simple. Marry a radical, risk-taking, go-anywhere-for-Jesus Christian. It's not easy. but you'll be glad you did. Number two. See if you agree with this. I'm sorry, I've left that picture of Nashville up there. Oops, and I hit the wrong button, Charlie. Hold on, we're going to get this straight here. That's my, that was my bad. I, I honestly went the wrong way with that. This was the scripture for number one. Sorry. I almost did it without any scripture if I wasn't paying attention. Give you a second to read that. By the way, this is one of the scriptures that was there Wednesday night, a uh, Sunday night, excuse me. No, Wednesday night. That was there Wednesday night. Somebody's favorite. Here's the next one. Number two, take your spouse to a Bible preaching, Bible structure, Bible obedient church not just take your spouse one time anytime the fellowship of Christians in the congregation meets together go take them all the time I don't care what it is go I know you can't make everything but you'll be better if you did you want to take your spouse because you want to go to that group that is there for you. You want to go to that congregation that's there to help you discover your gifts. Think about it. If you're only meeting with your church family one time, are you discovering the gifts that you have? How much longer is it going to take you if I was 18, Rod, go all the time to figure out your gifts, figure out your spouse's gifts, and use them. If you don't go all the time, how long is it going to take you to figure it out if you ever do? Because when I'm here to learn my spiritual gifts in my congregation, it helps the community to be better and to find Jesus. I have to be able to go. I have to make that resolution in my soul to say that's what I want to do. It's the church that God put here for you. It's not something man-made. It's not something we created. He did it because he knew you'd need it. And some of us don't take advantage. Or we wait till we're too late in life to go, I wish I'd done that more. So I tell the young ones, as if you were me, make that what you do. <clears throat> Join it, serve it, discover your gifts, be with the family that will help you, that will guard you, that will do their best to take care of you. That's why you need to go as much as you possibly can. I won't forget this time. The third, 
get biblically, if I was talking to myself when I was 18, get biblically educated. I mean really educated in the Bible. Now, I went to Harding University, and I like to think that I, I took Old Testament survey, and I took New Testament survey, and I remember thinking I want my, my kids to go here. I look back now, and even though that I went to Harding, I wish. I was, I was chicken. I know I was. I wish I'd taken Greek. I wish I'd taken Hebrew. And I wish I would have taken the hardest classes I could. Because one thing I've learned about school and education is, is that you take your math class, you take your English class, you go through it, and a lot of times we say we won't use that again, but you're tested on it. And you're graded. We don't do that in Bible class, do we? Well, wait, sometimes Judd gives out tests. I don't know. <laughs> what if you were tested in Bible? Well, you got a failing grade, it's okay. There's grace and mercy. Come back, take it again. I don't know. Work really hard at biblical education. I know we're not all going to a school that has classes like that, but say you're 18 now and you decided to go to UCA. And I'll say this because I've said it to every one of them that goes to UCA. I'd say, when Bears for Christ doors are open, be there. Jacob Mayfield's going to give you a good education. Don't pass it up. It's completely free. And we cook for you once a month, or once a semester. I was just throwing that in there. I love to see the kids, but get that education. Sometimes we just really knew it about it. Like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. No, no. Start now with an education. There are online courses. I've taken a ton from Sunset School of Preaching. Challenge yourself. Do more difficult Bible study. And I'd say that to myself back then. Because where would you be now if you were doing it, doing harder stuff, learning more about God's Word, revealing more truth that I could use to encourage people and help people every day? I think I spent too much time memorizing arguments to defend things, not that that's not bad, I mean that's okay to some extent, but I would rather have memorized more things to encourage more people in the trials of life. That would have been better for me. And how much farther would I have been down the road if I would started when I was 18? And we can do that here. We can get more education. The lesson, you want to sharpen your exegesis skills, right? Your critical understanding of the interpretation of the text. We don't do that all the time in our personal lives. We come here, we might have a teacher, but we could be doing that more on our own. Number four, resolve now, if I was talking to myself, to read your Bible every single day without exception. It is more important than eating. It is more important than exercising. It's bottom line it's super, super important. And George says it all the time. But when we're reading, let's not be checkbox reading. We have promoted that for years and years, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. And when I mean checkbox reading, I mean you get the plan out and you go, oh, I read that, check it off. I read that, I checked it off. And you just went through chapter by chapter and you read it, but you didn't get into it. You just said, well, I've read it. And I don't know. I, some of these people in here are like, Nathan, where's Nathan Powers at? He's here somewhere, right? No, he's not? Okay, I see Meredith there. Meredith would understand this. Actually, she would probably get this better, but 
But when I think about this, when I think about school and all those tests that I took and those times when you had to read a big long paragraph and answer the questions at the end, now Meredith, she'd read that big long paragraph and she'd know the answers to the questions. I would read that big long paragraph and go, I don't know what it's talking about. And sometimes I feel that's the way I read the Bible. I read it, I didn't stop, I didn't go back, I didn't look at it, but I went on to the next box and I checked it so I'd make myself feel good. Sometimes you've got to stop and reread and reread and what is this author trying to say what is the spirit trying to tell me and not just go I have a daily Bible reading plan but I have a plan that's going to make me better and stronger to help others in the community so it's not just to read your Bible every day it's to really get into that word to the point that other people can see the deeds that you do from the words that you read about Jesus. Number five, I want to become a Christian hedonist. Now, hedonist is the person that believes in the pursuit of pleasures is the most important thing, but I want to be a Christian one. I want to be one that is going to pursue God. I'm looking for the joy that there is in serving and loving and having a commune with God. That's what I want. That's what I want to tell myself 18 years ago. Don't set your aim on how much education you can get. Don't set your aim on how much wealth you can accumulate. Don't set your aim on all these other things out there. Set your aim on finding your joy with God. That's what you're looking for. The key to holiness and fruitfulness is finding joy in God. Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. A regular hedonist is never going to have any type of fruit. A Christian that's seeking to serve God is going to have fruit. So your lesson there is you want to make sure your aim is at the joy that you can find in God. <coughs> Finally, number six. Recognize, I was talking to myself when I was 18, I know I missed this for a long time. Not that I was bad or anything, but I, I missed this. Recognize that I'm not my own. I, I was just cruising through a few years thinking of the things I wanted to do, and I wasn't thinking, I'm not mine. I have been bought and purchased for with blood. When you go home, say a prayer. Say it out loud and say, I'm yours, God. You can do with me whatever you want. We're comfortable here, right? We're comfortable. We're comfortable in this, this building. But in the, in the United States, we're very comfortable. God, if you want to take my life, it is okay. God, if you decide you need to send me across the world, out of my comfort zone, it is okay. You do with me whatever you want. That's a hard prayer, I bet. But if we really sit down and think about how hard that would be, he needs you somewhere tomorrow that you've never thought about ever being completely out of your comfort zone. And that would be okay, because you know why? He owes us nothing. Nothing. He doesn't owe me or you anything. What else more does he need since he bought you with his son's blood? You have been purchased. You agreed. He owes you no more. So 
So, if I could talk to myself 30 years ago, say, marry a radical risk-taking, go anywhere for Jesus Christian, check. Take your Bible, take your spouse, excuse me, to Bible preaching, Bible structure, Bible obedient church, check. Get biblically educated, got a ways to go. Resolve now to read the Bible every day. How much have I missed as I've went? Become a Christian hedonist, I'm finding that now. And recognize I'm not my own, that I've been bought with a price. I don't know how many years I was thinking about doing my own thing when I should have been saying, what is it you want, God? I'll do it. Here am I, send me. We made catchy songs, skits, whatever. How often do we live by that? Are we ready to help do whatever God wants us to do in the kingdom? Are we ready to do and be there for our congregation of church families to discover our gifts that can help other people? Are we ready to be immersed in reading his word daily and getting into the depths of it to understand there's more than just the black and white on the page? Are we doing what we can do? There's still more to do, and I wish I'd have started a whole lot earlier. So if you're young in here, and there's some of it, I see you, don't waste time like I did. Start now. We always have the invitation. It's available at any time. Our elders are available. Now we have new things like technology where we can text the elders and we can know if there's a problem. We can help somebody. We can pray for them. You can just let us know. And I know being a Christian is hard out there. It's very difficult. Or maybe you're not a Christian and you want to be bought and paid for. You want that blood of Jesus. Well, you just repent. Confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And be immersed in the water and come into contact with Jesus' blood and have your sins washed away. He makes it awesome for us. And when we, we come up, usually as a new Christian, we're all excited. And I just forewarn anybody that wants to do this. We're all excited, but then Satan takes target at you because he doesn't want it to be smooth. He doesn't want you to find the support that you need. And he wants to make it difficult. But as you go, you get more into Christ. You can handle situations better. And the promise he gives us an eternal life, eternal home with him. How amazing that is. If you have any need, please come while we stand and sing.